You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Welcome back to Crimson Cast. Gail and Clavio joining you. It is Wednesday, the 25th of September, our last Wednesday of September for 2024. I'm not going to be sad uh, from a, a life perspective that September's ending, but it's been a great month for IU football so far, and that's what we're here to talk about today. we got Taylor Lehman back from Bite Size Bison. Uh, great to see you, Taylor. How are you doing? I'm good, Galen. I'm, I'm a Tigers fan, so, like, nothing can touch me right now. I'm, right. I'm like... I am on cloud nine. I have never been this dialed into baseball in September and like since in my adult life, I am ready. I mean, back back from the dead. I, I yeah, it's uh, really <laughs> remarkable stuff. Good for them. Good for you guys. I love it. Uh, it's we'll uh, we'll see what happens in the playoffs. These runs tend to carry, which you know you, you keep your fingers crossed, obviously. But uh, but good. That's, <laughs> it's good stuff. I I'm a Reds fan, so you know baseball was over in June, like it always is. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk IU football and looking forward to doing so. We got some questions from you folks out there. We're going to preview the Maryland game as well. Uh, before we get to all that, just a couple quick reminders. We are brought to you by Home Field Apparel, your place to go for the finest in college fashions, the softest fabrics, the coolest designs. Uh, if you were signed up for the, uh, the, the, the text that you get from Home Field Apparel, you will know that uh, they just restocked. They got some new IU stuff back in in vogue. And, uh, you know, it's among the many different things that Homefield has in their stock for IU football, especially. I mean, you know, one of the first places you could go to get IU football apparel, as well as apparel for schools all across the country. Uh, if you'd like to go check them out, it's homefieldapparel.com. Also check them out on Instagram and on Twitter, if you'd like 15% off your first order, use the code HOME23. That's HOME23. And uh, let them know we sent you. And you'll join the thousands of other Crimson Cast listeners and IU fans who are probably sporting home field apparel everywhere. Not just at the football game, Taylor, at weddings, uh, at, at parties, at uh, at random gatherings of, of professionals. Home field everywhere. And you should join that that pat well you have a bunch of home steel stuff you know exactly what i'm talking about so it's uh i just got a heavyweight shirt it, the heavyweight shirt fits me almost too well i'm actually yeah. terrified I, I, yeah <laughs> see, this stuff envelops you like a glove that's what home field does so uh go check them out homefieldapparel.com proud sponsor of the back home network i mentioned the Substack. we are on Substack here crimsoncast.substack.com is ours what's yours taylor uh, mine is uh, bitesizebison.substack.com. That's right. And uh, <laughs> I was not ready for that cue. <laughs> I normally I don't have Taylor <laughs> reads, but that's what I'm here. You know, I'm trying to mess things up a little bit for him. But uh, if you were on, I appreciate it. If you were on Bite Size Bison, you sh- which you should be, uh, you would be able to access great things like Taylor's uh, game day roundup from the Charlotte game earlier on this week. The the uh, the, the recap of that game, the preview of the game coming up versus the Maryland Terrapins and uh, just all kinds of delightful statistical stuff uh, with either. Actually, if you, if you subscribe to one, you really should subscribe to the other one. Uh, you know, on Crimson Cast, there's a free subscription where you can get all of our episodes delivered to your inbox for free. We also have a paid option, which is, I think, a pretty good value helps to support the podcast $5 a month, $50 a year. You can also subscribe to Bite Size Bison, which I'd highly recommend doing. It's the place to go to find out information statistically about IU football that you're just not getting anywhere else. And um, that one uh, you can find if you go to the Crimson Cast Substack and vice versa. The number of people that subscribe to Bite Size Bison and then get referred to Crimson Cast, it's, it's really, it's like, it's great. It's like we are like a Venn diagram. And I love it when people get in the middle of our circles. It's delightful. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I looked at the, it actually shows us that information. And, and I, I've looked at it a couple of times. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I like this. Uh, anybody who's listening to Crimson Cast, of course, is welcome over at Five Sides Bison. And I'm assuming vice versa. It's basically like I, I always think of it like we have two tree houses and they're in trees right next to each other. And and if you get let into one, you get let into the other. And, and I'm excited that we've got people playing in both tree houses simultaneously. So head over to you Substack. Like drop a board between them or something. Like a, yeah, like occasionally like a, a rope <laughs> swing or something like that. You know, we got we got a lot of options between the tree houses. 
Also, uh, just one last <laughs> one last read for you to start with. We are brought to you by Hoosier Game Day Lager, official craft beer of Indiana Athletics, and my favorite go-to on game days, the, the, the delightful candy-striped can. You can find it all over the stadium. You can find it wherever you purchase beer products, including liquor stores and grocery stores, and also all of Upland's great locations across central and southern Indiana. Um, a, a, an easy-drinking Vienna-style lager. It's got a lot more flavor than a lot of the adjunct lagers that you'll drink at normal concession stands. And you feel stylish doing it with that candy-striped can. Go pick up a six-pack of Hoosier Game Day Lager today, and please enjoy responsibly. Again, Hoosier Game Day Lager from Upland Brewing Company, the official craft beer of IU Athletics. All right, Taylor, let's talk IU Maryland. Uh, and I guess maybe let's start by finishing off the conversation on the Charlotte game. Uh, I think most people have read at least some aspect of your analysis on this, but as you've looked through all the stats and you've reflected on the game and some of the performances, I guess what stuck out to you the most for Indiana in that game? Uh, yeah, yeah. The first thing that comes to mind, simply because it's going to be in the preview tomorrow and uh, in, in the Maryland preview, is the, the way that they handled the middle eight minutes. Uh, I know that's kind of been a, a an emphasis of Chris Ignetti. And honestly, as they were approaching the middle eight, that's about the time when Charlotte had you know pulled it within three. It was 17 to 14. And I know a lot of folks, including myself, are like, okay, this is this is where like IU football historically shows that you know it's gonna struggle with one of these non-conference opponents. And this is this is where everything kind of comes back down to earth. But then the middle eight happened. They they got the ball, it was about the five minute mark until until halftime. Um and and they scored about two minutes later, they scored a touchdown. They got they actually got the ball back and then they scored again before halftime. And uh, and then they got the ball to start the third quarter. They scored a touchdown again. So in within those middle eight minutes, they scored 21 points. It was uh, 38 to 14 by the end of uh, those eight minutes. And so uh, that that is what the middle eight can do when you when you use it appropriately, when it works out in your favor. Not all of it is always in the coach's hands. A lot of it is due to chance. But, um, you know. The, he took advantage of that situation and, and knowing that they could get the ball to start the third quarter also helped them kind of increase some of the risk that they that they took on offense. But, yeah, that was the biggest thing that stood out to me just off the top of my head. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that, I, you know, I'm not a lot of people have not been that familiar with the middle eight, those last four minutes of the first half, first four minutes of the second half. I mean, it. but we've talked about it on the other side. I mean, it was a concern in the UCLA game. Uh, given that you know UCLA scored those seven points at the end of the first half, I don't think they scored the field goal in the first four minutes of the second half. But you know they were, they were driving the ball. But you know there is this like statistically demonstrated trend that occurs at, at the pro level and at the college level both about that being key, and it's largely because of that that possession exchange and this idea that. You know, if you're if you're able to finish off the first half strong, and then you get that second half, I mean, you can score several uh, points without the other team really being able to respond, and that can really turn the tide of a game, and it completely changes the way that you call plays or the type of personnel sets you're running and things like that. So, yeah, that was definitely a positive. You know, I, I would say I've had a little bit of time to reflect. I also podcasted about the game a little bit yesterday. You know, the the, the one other thing I'll note. And you and I talked about it a little bit over text. It's just like I've been really impressed, I think, with how much more flexible the running blocking seems to be for this IU team, uh, how well they're able to use a variety of different people, not just linemen, but also tight ends and, re and receivers, and how many options there seem to be for running the ball, including Curtis Rourke, who – you know, when you went back and you, you watched the broadcast, one of the early – you can always – I was talking about this on Bison Chant last night. One of the things you can tell – is what the coaches want to emphasize to the broadcasters because the broadcasters always blurt that out in the first five minutes of the game. And they were talking like, you know, they're really telling Curtis Rourke he needs to run more, uh, you know, because there's like openings there that are like, you know, eight, ten yards. And, and he, sure enough, he did a bunch of that. Uh, it'll be interesting in this upcoming game. Uh, and, you know, this is not to not to spoil your preview at all, but, you know, given what the Maryland – defense and particularly the defensive line looks like they are best able to do there may be even more opportunities for not just Curtis work to to move the chains with his legs but it feels like the running game in general for IU 
could be a real handful for that Maryland defense to deal with and, and something they really haven't faced so far this season. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting actually, Galen, because the, the more that I dig into to this uh this Maryland team, the more I kind of realize the the only real weapon they have is their pass rush. Even even the even the defensive line doesn't necessarily work in run defense, but they are they have two top ten uh in the Big Ten anyway, two top ten edge rushers. And so if 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 the offensive line holds off that pass rush, the, the pass game could certainly get going. But yeah, like you were saying, the, the rushing attack, um, there are going to be opportunities there. Now, statistically, teams haven't necessarily broken anything wide open against uh, against Maryland on the ground. But the success rate, the consistent uh, meeting of expectation uh, in certain running scenarios, that is happening for Maryland's opponents. So um, the run game seems like it will be there. It seems like Maryland really sells out for the pass rush. And, um, you know, and, and if you don't back that up uh, fundamentally, uh, kind of like the way IU does uh, from their defensive line standpoint, um, then you can really find yourself in a, in a predicament, especially if you're giving up the yardage on the ground. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And, you know, as we kind of dive into this this Maryland game overall, you know, the, the, the thing that strikes me, I guess, is. Maryland, they're not a bad team. I mean, you know, they, they clearly have talent and they they clearly have, I think, a pretty good idea of what they want to be as a team within the confines of what their personnel are. But, you know, I don't think you you can't look at Maryland without you know looking at that game that they lost at home versus Michigan State, a team that I think there's still quite a few question marks about and say, well, that that really looks like a problem that uh, they haven't quite solved yet, you know, what, what occurred in that game and why they lost it. And, you know, when you look at their, their team overall, you know, it feels to some degree like they've feasted a little bit offensively on some poor competition, but they haven't played defense nearly as well as Indiana has had against roughly similar competition. Uh, you know, and this is where it's tough because I think everybody's been waiting for some kind of other shoe to drop with IU in terms of, well, the competition is going to get tougher. It may get tougher in this game, but I I can't help but look at Maryland and say, well, this is a, an average Big Ten team. Like, they're not, they're not, they're certainly not in the upper echelon. They may not even be in the second echelon. And the question is, like, where do they actually fall in terms of the rank order of Big Ten teams? And, you know, at this point, even given the lack of competition for both, like, you, you can't just pat Maryland on the back and say, well, you went to a bowl last year and Indiana didn't, so we're going to consider you better, which is what a lot of people seem to be doing. If you're just looking at the numbers between these two teams, Indiana does look like the better team on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maryland feels like a, a high floor, low ceiling type of team. Uh, like you were saying, kind of like an average Big Ten team. Uh, the, the, the Billy Edwards has surprised me uh, with how well that he has played so far. Uh, but yeah, they have some they have some weapons, and but I don't I don't think it's as uh, I don't think the talent is as widespread on the roster uh, as as we've seen from from the team like Indiana, uh, or, or at least the systems uh, don't exploit their talent as much as Indiana's do. Um, but yeah, when when you look at the you know the way that they've been graded from PFF, especially on the defensive side, um, it hasn't been. Uh, that hasn't been impressive, especially in the secondary. But then, when, you know, when you think about the offensive line, that's 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 the first thing that I always look at with Big Ten teams, especially, is the offensive line. And their offensive line is just really unserious. Galen, I think I texted you about that. You um, did. <laughs> it's <laughs> like they they have a – their left guard is one of their highest graded offensive linemen so far this season. And he moved over from the defensive line after three seasons on the defensive line. And then they have, uh, you know, three other guys that have transferred in this offseason uh, to, to build up that offensive line. And, and the only one who's signed and been developed as an offensive lineman is their left tackle. And he has been one of the worst tackles in the F in FBS. So this this offensive line is terrible. And, uh, you know, it, it, and when you're playing a team like Indiana, that is where you have to be good because Indiana puts so much emphasis on the defensive line. So. Um, you know, I, I think in the Big Ten, unless you have a really well schemed passing attack, kind of like Indiana in 2019 uh, with with Kalen DeBoer, you really can only go as far as your offensive line can take you, and and I don't think that's going to take Maryland very far.
Yeah. Now that doesn't necessarily mean Indiana is going to walk in the game. I mean, I think this is, this is a game where if they're no. not dialed in and if they're not taking Maryland seriously, uh, I think they could, you know, Maryland could win the game. Indiana could have real problems. I did. There was a question from uh, one of our listeners that I wanted to jump back. It was from Derek Fields, uh, who uh, is always a good contributor of questions to the podcast. We always appreciate Derek. But he asked, was Signetti as extra focused on this Maryland game in his presser as it seemed from his comments on last year's game to his coming out and saying he'd be surprised if the Hoosiers weren't ready to play for this one? Should we see a crisp Hoosiers performance? I mean, we even heard this a little bit earlier in the week where he, you know, kind of went out of his way to mention that he watched a lot of Maryland tape in the offseason. It kind of does feel like there's a bit of a circle around this game for Kurt Signetti because uh, I think he... I think he takes Maryland seriously, and I think he looks as, at this as really being a barometer for where his team is at as they get into this middle portion of the schedule. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think he's right. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, Galen, I think you and I had that game uh, marked when we talked preseason about about this is kind of like their prove-it game. This is when we figure out how, how good this team is, um, especially given the circumstances. It's a little more regular now instead of going out to L.A. to play UCLA. Um, so, yeah, it, I, I think, you know, I think it's fair to to assess it that way. But also the sharpness with which Signetti is kind of talking this week, I've also noticed is a little uh, a little different than what it has been in the past. And I also think part of it, too, is just wanting to create pop, more positive momentum going into a, a Big Ten schedule. Um, so, yeah. And I also think, you know, on, on the other hand, too, it's uh, it's it's more than just Signetti. It's uh, when, when he's saying that he would be surprised if his uh, players weren't prepared to, to play this game. Um, a lot. Of, I mean, the best football teams have player driven uh, culture. And so and they say they usually take on the the personality of their head coach. Um, Jim Harbaugh was really good at that at Michigan, um, even though it all seemed kind of delusional. It, it, it was it was it was all planned. And, uh, you know, they're doing the weird tribute to him when he gets uh, when he got suspended or whatever. But that is that's a sign of just like a good locker room that and there's a reason why they went on to win the championship. So, um, you know, I think I think, you know, what he's saying there is that the leaders in this locker room are are also leading the culture and they also like the players the players aren't uh, only listening to the coach they have their own thoughts too and they understand that and they see these things they see that maryland is uh kind of what we're talking about like the barometer and and they they won't make that point too so i think that all kind of runs together i guess i mean last year you, know, you could make the argument that it was the Maryland game that that really kind of drove the nail in the coffin of the season for IU. I mean, you know, the, the, the Akron game was bad, and Indiana won that one. And then they had to travel to Maryland. They lose 44-17 to 17 in that game. And, and really, from there, it was just like everything unraveled. And, you know, the previous year, they lose to Maryland at home, 38-33. to 33. You know that was that looked like maybe the last that game and the Rutgers game the following week. It's like you if they if they had won those two games they would have gone to a bowl if everything else had stayed pat, but they didn't. Um, you know, and and then of course Maryland also beat them thirty eight thirty five the previous year. Uh, you know, so this is three game three days three years in a row Maryland has beaten Indiana, and look, I mean, you know, Tagovailoa is the quarterback, and you know, I think a good influx of talent from Mike Loxley combined with Indiana going downhill. Uh, it just, to me, it feels like internally, maybe this game is very important because, you know, you, the, the UCLA game was important in as much as that was a big game on the road against a big 10 opponent. You get off to a one and zero start in the conference, but this is like, okay, we didn't know UCLA. We know Maryland. We owe Maryland <laughs> uh, after this past three seasons. And I'm sure for Signetti, he kind of looks at it. And he's, and even the, the part about Billy Edwards, I think it was, you know, being a quarterback they had recruited at, I don't know if ever it was Elon or JMU. <laughs> and, uh, and now, I mean, again, I think as a coach, it's like, well, that we didn't, we didn't work with that guy. I want to be able to, to demonstrate that we've got the superior quarterback. There's a lot of little things like that that sometimes can factor into these. And and granted, it's all under the larger confines of we got to go win the game. But if there's extra motivation to not just win it, but demonstrate like we are the superior program now, certainly I understand some of the comments a little bit better. We also could be reading completely too much into it, Taylor. I don't know. 
it also could be a DMV thing, you know, coming from coming from yeah. JMU, and it also it also could be that as well. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of intersections of things, uh, intersections of interests here for uh, for Curse Ignetti. But yeah, like I mean, like you and Scott had said on, on your last episode, um, this was always kind of the game where it was like, you know, one or the other was gonna was gonna was was gonna have room in the Big Ten East, and and so there's there's like a weird kind of uh, short history here <laughs> between these two programs and. Uh, yeah, I think I think Indiana and Indiana fans really want this one. Let's get to some other questions that we got from the folks out in Cyberland. Um, so this is an interesting one from uh, from Matt. Uh, what stats or or statistical figure do you think is the biggest fool's gold thus far due to IU football's competition level? Like, is there something where they look really good statistically that you're like, ah, that may not be, that may be statistical noise or that may just be an artifact of playing teams that aren't very good. Is there anything that sticks out to you like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, the PFF grades, <laughs> uh, the, the, the overall PF grade, PFF grades, I think the, the individual player PFF grades can, can, can be indicative uh, of performance, but, uh, those are not opponent adjusted. And so, you know, when, when you're looking at these, uh, statistical previews that I put together, I always, I always go through, I'm like, Oh, wow. You know, uh, PFF overall, they have Indiana as the third best team in the country. <laughs> it's like, okay, well that it, it's, it's just uh, execution and, uh, it, the, the way that they grade them, the, those are just a collection of grades in, in a micro sense that they try yeah. to then create a, a macro, uh, sense of the grades and it, it it's basically how well did you execute what you wanted to do against the opponents you had it's not opponent adjusted so uh i think those i think the 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 those pff grades are are kind of uh some fool's gold um but there are others too i mean um i mean really i i'm at, at this point anything that's not opponent adjusted right now is is uh is pretty tough like um like Indiana has the the top offensive EPA per play in, in the country. And, uh, you know, they have a great offense and they've been fantastic offensively, but I don't know if I would be ready to say that they are the best offense in the country um, right now. So, you know, opponent adjustments really important early on in the season. So I, I think that's kind of, that, that's, that's, that's the way that I kind of approach it. It's more of like a profile of what the team is versus how good they are. So okay, I want to I want to stay on that for a second. Ryan Cotter had a question. A lot of efficiency numbers I've seen are adjusted for opponent. How much can we actually read into those given the relatively weak schedule, and how well does adjusting for an opponent actually work? So may, maybe tackle that first. Like you know, how does that work? And then I want to come back to yeah. something. You said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually uh, I I uh, read a really good article uh, a while back about the. How, how you build a statistical model to account for uh, opponent and basically it just uses a multi multivariate regression and statistical concepts that are like um, it's not necessarily about weak opponents it's it's more it's somewhat of like the transitive property but how how did you um, perform against them uh, versus their averages against their other opponents? Right. You know, so it, it, the the example the article used was like if if you uh, allowed nine yards per carry to your opponent, that seems really bad. But then when you look at all their other games, and they average ten yards per carry. It's like okay, well we we did okay because it was only nine. So um, you know, once you consider those residuals, then um, you can kind of get it, it kind of boosts uh, your your whatever metric you're using. So I think you know four weeks into a season, I think is pretty good for opponent adjustment. Uh, um, and, and you can see that the very first one that comes to mind is FIU, like Indiana, Indiana, you know, deconstructed FIU and then FIU immediately came out and, and destroyed central Michigan. And they, they've, you know, they've impressed some folks, uh, but I don't think it, as much, as much as that, that week two game. But, um, but when you consider the way that their opponents have played against their other, their other teams, then, and then how well Indiana performed against them, I think it, they're, they're pretty accurate. Um, and also, like I saw recently that opponent adjusted uh, EPA per play, Indiana is ranked seventh in the country right now. And so you see those and you're like, there's no way that can be true. But it's mostly just in, in comparison uh, of how their opponents played against their the rest of their schedule. 
Yeah, I mean, we talk about this a lot on the basketball front too, and it's it's a it's a tough concept because we're not used to thinking about the idea that it's how you perform against what the computer thinks the other team should do in an average game. That's essentially what you're talking about with the opponent adjustment. Um, and it, you know, it's is it a perfect system? No. Because you've got a bunch of factors. Like, what if you're not playing an average game? What if you play a great game? And, you know, now, I mean, even if, you know, like, there's there's te- technically ways that you can factor that in, but a lot of it ends up coming back to it's a way to try to establish over an entire statistical body of, of games, which is, you know, thousands of games in a, a college football season, ten, you know, almost well, probably maybe tens of thousands of games in a college basketball season. I mean, there's a lot of games that you're dealing with. And so much of it comes down to this system does more often than not by about the midway point of the season, draw a fairly accurate picture of what each statistical area is doing relative to the expectations of the other teams and their statistical areas. That is a little too squishy for a lot of people who wouldn't just a straightforward, well, this team's better than that team. But I think there's the nuance there, but it, it leads to some interesting things. You know, it's like you mentioned, yeah, Indiana's number one in the country in EPA per play, which feels like perhaps fool's gold, but they're number one in success in pass, which I find, I think more fascinating, like, because that there's a whole bunch of other factors there besides just how good or bad your opponent is. And, for Indiana to be number one in that after four weeks, uh, for them to be number one in points per drive, for them to be, uh, you know, like, you know, and in, in and on the defensive side, Indiana's ninth in points per drive. I mean, even against bad competition, there are teams that are not doing what Indiana's doing statistically on either side of the ball, which is something that we tried to emphasize over the weekend. Now, does that hold up as the competition gets harder? Maybe, maybe not, but that doesn't mean that the performance they've turned in so far hasn't been really good. It might just mean there's other factors that keep it from continuing that way. That doesn't like erase what already occurred. And if there are alterations based on Indiana not performing as well, those will show up in the statistical analyses, but they won't completely erase what happened earlier. If that makes any sense. Yeah. It's, it's very like very much the way that people think of the SP plus model too, is, is it pulls from the last, as you're closer to the, to this season, to the beginning of this season, it pulls from the last season to create some sort of weighted uh, or some sort of weight for each, for each team. So when, when a team does really well against them, they have uh, a weight to apply to, to that metric. And so it, it takes a while to respond. It also takes a while, like you were saying, Galen, to, to get a full idea of how good each team is, how much you should weight them um, and, and things like that. So, so yeah, it's it's not it's not perfect. Um, it, it's it's more perfect than uh, uh, than stats out of context. And like you were saying, uh, success rates are are a great way to kind of measure a team uh, in terms of consistency. And and we've seen plenty of passing success consistently from from IU this season. So uh, that would make a lot of sense. But yeah, I, I think um, it's it's a really good question. It's also one of those things where. Um, Indiana has been so impressive, especially offensively, throughout these first four games. I don't, they, they can't keep this trajectory up, so we're gonna see some. We're gonna see some downward trend at some point um, of of this of this offense and even the defense. I'm sure, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's getting worse. It just means that you know the competition is just you know increasing. A uh, question from Jamie Jordan: Do you have an unsung hero on both sides of the ball so far? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, so I, uh, Josh Sanguinetti uh, is is one, and, and <laughs> been around I, for like a decade. Is he allowed to be unsung yeah. at this point? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, these. Yeah, he, it, actually, it's really funny because I'm going to name two people who have been on the team forever, and and, and so Josh Sanguinetti on the on the defensive side, he's graded as the second best safety in the Big Ten uh, right now by PFF. I think part of it is that he's just hasn't really like needed to be used that often (laughs) because the the defensive line has just been so effective and the linebackers are right there too. But when he has gotten his opportunities, he he's played well. Um, So, which, which has been impressive to me because I've never been really high on Josh Sanguinetti. So um, it's been nice to see that, but then on the offensive side, Mike Kadick uh, at at center, I think, you know, the way that that offensive 
line unit has come together has had a lot to do with Mike Kiddick. Uh, he's graded as a top five center in the Big Ten right now. And, um, you know, I I can't say that I was necessarily anticipating that when even when he came back, you know, I, I was I was happy to see that he came back because they needed some experience on this offensive line and uh, especially the Big Ten level and for him to come back and, and, and be the anchor the way that he has been and play as well as he has. But I think that's uh, huge for this, especially for just the offense and Curtis Roar. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think those two are probably the for me. Um, Jeremy Hood asks the following, looking at the snap counts on bite size Bison for our defense against Charlotte, the starters in the secondary and linebacker positions played 76% or more of the snaps, which makes me nervous how these guys will hold up. Um, basically asking if you guys have any concern on the depth of the defense, particularly in the secondary and linebacker positions as we move forward, I'll, I'll let you handle this one. Uh, not as much linebacker, but definitely secondary. This is definitely something that I'm concerned about. Um, this this is probably my biggest concern for the team is is how um, the the contrast between the number of players who play uh, in in the more competitive games, like in, like in UCLA and uh, and also in, in, for some reason in, against Charlotte too, like they, they didn't get a ton of rotation and um, and. Yeah, I, I think it's concerning. Um, I think, you know, at corner, I think they're actually a little bit better than I thought they would be. Jamari Sharp was pretty impressive against Charlotte, uh, but I don't know about safety. Uh, yeah. So we haven't seen a ton of the guys behind them. And and so, um, yeah, that is a concern. And mostly just because of the, the continued unknown uh, variables with, with the defensive backfield, especially a safety that – you, you know, we talked about before the season started, and since the stars have gotten so many snaps, we don't really know exactly what is behind them. So, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I am concerned about that. Yeah, it's tough because, like, on the one hand, I think the secondary almost had to be reestablished, and you know, you you had to get a pecking order out there. You had to get guys who knew what they were doing early on. I do wonder if, you know, especially in the next couple of games, right now and the. the for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, the Maryland game may not be that game, but definitely the Northwestern game, you may have the opportunity to rotate a couple of, of, of you newer players in younger players in players that aren't playing as much. It would be nice to see. Now I will say, it seems like Indiana has largely gotten by so far through the first third of the season without any major injuries that I can think of. It's actually been a remarkably injury free year, uh, which is, is kind of an undersold part of what we've seen. I mean, given the amount of injuries IU has suffered the last few years, like <laughs> something must have really changed with their strength and conditioning program and the way that they were doing things. Um, so Indiana has been lucky from that perspective. I and mean, obviously, if you can keep your guys out there and healthy, that's the best way to handle this situation. But I do wonder, like, do we start to see a little more rotation, a couple more snaps going to guys who who aren't in the starting lineup? Uh, simply as a matter of necessity, given that you have still got multiple, you know, many games left to play in the season, at least nine. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and, and um, you know, even along the defensive line too, uh, I think you know, defensive end is is a, is a position that I don't think uh, they're super deep in, and so uh, yeah, like you were saying, Galen, I mean, um, you. Look, at it's such a strange uh, contrast between the offense and defense because yeah. the offense is just so deep at every position. And, I mean, except for the offensive line, but uh, but like you look at the defense and it's like, okay, well they're 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 pretty deep at defensive tackle, um, and and I think they they have some depth at linebacker, but uh, but you get outside of that and it's like, oh, okay, that's a little shaky. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. I think we'll see exactly where that is at in, in, in the next couple of games. So we had a bunch of really curious so, the secondaries that in general, sorry, that this you know, I am, Maryland. I am too. Yeah. I mean, they've obviously, they've got a great receiver. They got to go up against, they've got a quarterback who's by far the most functional quarterback they'll have played so far. And I think you mentioned on one of your statistical breakdowns, this is the highest rated quarterback that Indiana will maybe like well certainly will face has faced so far that, yeah i mean you know and it's it's just it'll be interesting to see how they handle a level of live competition in the passing game that they haven't had up to this point 
Um, we had several questions that were something in the vein of what uh, J.D. Klein writes. The forecast is getting wetter by the day with the remnants of Hurricane Helen moving into the region on Friday night. How does the rain impact the two teams? Who gets the advantage? Uh, Jordan Bailey asks, if it's wet, does it favor the Hoosiers who have a stronger ground and pound game? Uh, we had another question about weather uh, that popped up somewhere else in the feed. I can't find it right now. Uh, but a lot of weather questions and, and a lot of questions about what it would look like if this was maybe not a repeat of Virginia from whatever that year that was, 2018, but certainly a very wet game. Uh, who does that favor in your, uh, in your opinion and why? I mean, I think it favors Indiana. I think they're stronger in the trenches on both sides. Uh, the The defensive line's not super. The Maryland's defensive line's not super great at run defense. Uh, Indiana has the seventh best rush, rushing success in the country. Um, the, the Justice Ellison is actually graded as the he has the highest rushing grade of all Big Ten running backs. Um, and and you know he's just one of four. <laughs> and, and so I, I think when it comes to the the, the running game, Indiana has. The, the pretty obvious favor, uh, but I, I I do think that Maryland can be sneaky on the ground. I, their offensive line is is you know not good, but Roman Hemby is extremely talented. I mean that guy almost ran for a thousand yards a couple of years ago. Like I I have a hard time you know counting him out at all, and I don't think he's getting a, a lot of talk in this matchup because of Ty Felton and and Billy Edwards, but. Uh, Roman Hemby is a very talented runner. So uh, if it gets into a running match, I, I could see it being a little more competitive than people think it might be. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, Galen, I, I, I don't think the rain really affects the, the game as much as people think it does. I, you still see a lot of, a lot of rainy games turn into passing games. And so um, I think there might be more passing than people think there might be. I don't think you have to go all the way to rushing. So this has been an interesting thing. Now I'm going to, I'm going to show the people who are watching on YouTube, a couple of different things here. Uh, you know, we, we've tried to integrate some more graphics into what we do here on, uh, on Crimson cast, but uh, let me start. JD Gebby was nice enough to send us uh, this, this tweet, which he, which he uh, started off with boom, see everyone Saturday. And you can see like, first of all, it's got the remnants of Helen, kind of stalling out and moving, uh, taking a left turn at Nashville and then essentially hanging out in the Paducah area for a while with Bloomington kind of being outside of the primary cone. So that would be, that'd be fine. Like, you know, you wouldn't have a lot of, of weather related items there, but you know, what I, what I do wonder, not so much the rain, cause I agree with you. I think sometimes the rain is overrated in terms of what it does. There's a lot of throwing that does happen in the rain, like sometimes it's going to be harder to run in the rain because you much get much less footing and you've got a better advantage as a receiver than you do as a running back because you're not cutting and, and the way that you are in a lot of cases. But the wind, I think, is going to be interesting because if you look right now, and this has changed every six hours, so this could change tomorrow. But if you look at the afternoon forecast uh, on the 28th when the game is, Wind gusts 13 miles an hour, that's actually gone down a little bit from what it was earlier, where I think wind gusts were closer to 20 to 25 miles an hour. That can affect the passing game. So I think if it's just rain, I'm with you. If it's rain and wind, all bets are off. But I do agree with you. I think that actually it, it favors Indiana for a variety of reasons. And, you know, just just the, the basic fact that you're, you know, you, you're playing at home and you're used to running the ball and you've run the ball so effectively and you're used to scoring on the ground, whereas Maryland, not quite as much. I think that those are some factors that go in Indiana's favor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, Maryland's Maryland's defense has been, you know, okay. against as against running attacks. I think I was saying earlier, but, but they do allow a lot of success on the ground. And so, you know, I, yeah, I think just introducing elements into into the game. I don't think that's going to make Maryland's defense any better. So, so I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if it if it does turn into a, a windy, like you're saying, Galen, and which I didn't even think about, was the wind, but the the a windy, rainy competition. Uh, I do think Indiana has the has the favor there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our our buddy Hooperazzi asks, I want to see how you football win, but a part of me wants to see this team face adversity. Is anyone else interested in seeing in this team if this team has Moxie? I'm not. 
I, you know, to me, the greatest amount of moxie is never letting anybody get close to you. Like that's that's <laughs> moxie, capital M. Uh, I'll take that any day of the week. I I don't want a close win. I want Indiana to win by a couple of touchdowns against everybody that they play. And I, you know, I, if we if we get to the point where we're complaining because Indiana's games are not close enough because they're too good for their competition, uh, you know, sign me up for whatever reality we find ourselves in with that. That sounds ideal. Uh, yeah, yeah, Galen. I think they will win by two scores. I think, uh, you know, we might we might get into that later. But I, th- I think this. I, I think the. I think I think this. I don't, I don't think it's going to be that. I don't think it's going to be that close. I. Interesting. I, uh, I I just think this offense is just too good, um, and and you know the, I think the defense is uh, gonna. I, I mean, honestly, the, I mean if if we want to talk about adversity, I, I think this defense is just generally facing adversity this week with Ty Felton, and and I think that's uh, their like their first real adversity of the yeah. season, and and so that's that's really what I'm interested in is when Indiana's on the field defensively, but I still I I. I think Indiana is going to take care of business. Let's let's explore that a little bit. Like you know, you, if so, what is Indiana hanging their hat on if they win this game decisively? Like you're saying, like what if we're if we're casting that scenario forward, like what was the game like that caused Indiana to win by a couple of scores or better? Uh, they didn't turn the ball over. You know, they're one of three teams that hasn't turned the ball over in FBS play, and Maryland leads the Big Ten in forced turnovers. So, you know, one of those has to give and, and, you know, if any, again, it doesn't turn the ball over. I think, I think, you know, it's, I don't think it'd be close because, you know, Maryland has relied on that. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, they, I, I, if they, if they hold off Maryland's pass rush, if, if the offensive line holds off the pass rush, if Curtis Rourke uh, isn't feeling too much pressure and even when he is feeling pressure, he's been solid, but if he's not feeling too much pressure, I don't think Maryland's defense is, is going to even be a speed bump for this offense. Um, their secondary is just not very good. Uh, and I don't think their linebackers can make up for that play. So um, I think if, if there's solid pass protection from the offensive line, I think. I, and, 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 you know, we were just talking about the elements. If, if it is a passing game, then I, I think that's, that's really where this game is decided. I don't, I don't think that the Maryland offense, even with Ty Felton can keep up with this offense. Yeah. I, I look at it. If I'm going to take a pessimistic view, which I almost feel like I'm contractually obligated to do as an <laughs> IU podcaster. Like I think I signed that some at some point, but uh, yeah, it, it feels like if you're looking for the route through which Indiana doesn't win this game, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, they, they turn the ball over a couple of times uh, Maryland does a really good job of stymieing the offense early, and then the defense just you know can't can't make the plays in the passing game that they need to. Uh, and, and look, all those things could happen. Again, this Maryland team has beaten Indiana three years in a row, albeit two of those wins were not blowouts; they were close games, and those were bad. Uh, those were really bad teams that Indiana was fielding in 2021 and 2022. Um, so it's not like this has been a decisive Maryland tilt over the last few years, but they. You know, it's it's clearly a team that is not going to be afraid of Indiana. They might be kind of curious about them at this point, but they're going to come in thinking, well, we won last time we were here and we beat them last year out in College Park. We can do it again. So it just it's going to be interesting to me, you know, what Maryland's confidence levels look like and how their defense matches up early against IU. I will say the one other thing, I, um, I, you know, Indiana's offense had a bit of a slow start against Charlotte. Some of that, I think, was hangover from UCLA. Uh, some of it was, you know, maybe just some bad luck on a couple of plays and some good plays by Charlotte early on. But y- you would like to see Indiana's offense, like, really get off to a good start. To some degree, that's really what caused the game to go as well as it did against UCLA. You know, they they, they get the touchdown on the first drive. They force the turnover on the next play, and then they score again. And it's like, well, you're off and running at that point. And that's my big hope for IU is that they they get it rolling quickly they establish themselves as the lead team they make uh you know Maryland play catch up essentially that's that's the most advantageous spot for this IU team to be in and I think that gives them a level of confidence in terms of uh, of being able to finish the game off and you know we'll we'll see what happens with all that but those are kind of the things I'm looking for as we go into it 
Yeah, in, in conjunction with that, uh, Galen, I think something defensively that that might put that might leave Indiana vulnerable is if they do surrender anything on the ground, like they did in Charlotte. They they had that Charlotte had the early rushing success. Um, obviously, I think that was schematic. I think Bryant Haynes fixed that in the second half. Um, but if they have another performance like that against Roman Hemby, that's going to be tough because uh, Maryland already uses a lot of screens. And that is the way the offenses have really been attacking this defense. And so, and they've been successful in the screen game. So if they're giving up screens um, or successful plays on, with screens, uh, if they're giving up, you know, yards on the ground, that that's a lot of, um, th that's a lot of dynamic to be allowing as a defense and, and be able to cap it. So I think, um, you know, if, if, if those two things happen, I think it could be, it could be a close one. Yeah. Especially if it happens without early offensive success, like you were saying. Well, it should be a fascinating one, and and certainly I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, the it's been a real joy watching this IU team every week, and uh, you know, every week I'm excited to see what they've got planned next, and uh, you know how everything plays out. I mean, clearly a lot a lot to watch in this game. It'll be a, a fascinating con, you know, you know, combination of events, not just these two teams playing each other, but the potential for weather. Um, we had a question from Jordan Bailey about like, what are the effective tie downs for a canopy? I, I think it's entirely dependent. I bought, there are some, there are some weights I bought at Lowe's that did a good job of weighing the canopy down for the FIU game, which weirdly had a, a wind issue. Uh, or maybe it was Western Illinois that had the wind issues. The, yeah, that was it. So, um, the, those weights that slide over the legs are a good move, but I will say if it's really windy, don't put a canopy up. Uh, I'll always remember the Penn state. It was the game. It was actually the game that Penix blew out his knee the first time. Uh, there was a high wind warning that happened, in, I think, about two hours before the game, and it came through and it like massacred all of the canopies that were set up in the Memorial Stadium tailgate area, including mine. Like, and mine was largely massacred because my neighbor's canopy flew right into our canopy and knocked the crock pots over. Like, it was a huge mess. So, my my point is. If you're at all concerned or not certain about the weighing down, you're almost better off standing in the rain because a flying canopy in, in high wind is is no joke, folks. You, you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So does your insurance company. Uh, so just maybe keep that in mind. But a lot of different things that are going to be happening around this game. Uh, hopefully a big crowd. Supposedly only about 4,000 tickets left for this game. So, you know, hopefully the weather cooperates. Might have a wet crowd, but it should be fun. It'll be warm outside at the very least. And uh, should be a really fascinating event. So, Taylor, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, no, no, Galen. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, ready to watch the Detroit Tigers in the playoffs. But <laughs> yes, Taylor, Taylor, I, Taylor, I, I, from the Tigers, I love it. It's great. Um, yeah, I can't be distracted. Well, folks, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. And uh, Taylor, really appreciate the time as always. And thanks to all you folks for listening in. Uh, we'll be back. Actually, I don't know whether this is going to drop before or after, but check out Scott's interview with the folks from Punt John Punt. We got them out of retirement. They're going to talk some IU football. So go check that show out and also check out our recap coming up on Sunday. For Taylor Lehman, I'm Galen Clavio. You're listening or watching the Crimson Cast. We'll catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. Stay never daunted. So long, everybody.